documents accessible. I guess I'll start again. <laughs> um, hi, everyone, and welcome to Making Documents Accessible in Canvas. My name is Anwar Hijaz. I'm a faculty mentor with the CVC, and I'm a political science professor at Saddleback College. Before we begin, I'd like to let everyone know that we have two sign language interpreters in the meeting, um, Claire Backman and Joanna Smith. I'm now pleased to introduce to you our two wonderful co-facilitators for today's webinar, Karen Crozer and Suzanne uh, Joaquin. Uh, Karen uh, is an associate professor of English at Los Angeles Mission College, where she serves as the chair. During the pandemic, Dr. Um, Karen served as a distance education specialist for Los Angeles Community College District, leading webinars at, on accessibility, active learning in Zoom, and OER rubric. Um, Dr. Karen is currently the main LACCD facilitator for the four-week course of creating accessible course content. In addition, she serves as a lead trainer for the three-week course called Introduction to Asynchronous Teaching in Zoom. She also conducts training throughout the district on arti artificial intelligence and higher education. Known for, um, she's known for being uh, supportive to her students and, um, create, and creating lots of strategies on that. She has been voted Faculty of the Year by CalWORKS, um, and she's also passionate about leveling the playing field for students with disabilities and has published a short book called Captions Made Easy to help faculty create ADA compliant video captions. Um, Suzanne Joachim is a coordinator for distance education and student learning outcomes at Butte Community College. She's also a biology instructor, instructor who has designed and developed over a dozen biology courses in multiple modalities for multiple institutions. She does statewide and international work in open educational resource as a certificate facilitator for Creative Commons and project facilitator for the ASCCC OER initiative. Suzanne has created self-paced Canvas courses, including online course design for Butte College, as well as OER accessibility courses for ASCCC. She has presented at national and international conferences on topics including universal design for learning, adaptable course and assessment design, open pedagogy, and uh, equitable course design. Suzanne is, a, uh, is proud to have worked with At One since 2017. So um, during this webinar, we will also be linking you all to a survey for you to provide feedback. We'll be dropping a link in the, for the survey about 30 minutes in, and then we'll be dropping it about 15 minutes um, thereon. We ask that you please fill out the survey. This really allows us to create more programming and to um, tailor what you guys are all looking for. Lastly, while At One offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide badges for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the web webinar, complete the survey and request a copy of your responses to be sent through the Google form. Um, you can use this information as your proof of attendance. So I will go ahead and pass it on to our wonderful facilitators. Welcome everyone, I'm Karen and I'm so glad that you're here. So uh, Suzanne and I put together a presentation for you and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully all of you can see that. And um, I'm going to begin our presentation and Suzanne may um, add anything if she wants to along the way. Um, and then Suzanne will do the second half of the presentation. Um, but when one of us isn't presenting, the other will try to watch um, the chat and get to any questions that some of you may have. But thank you again for being here. I know a lot of us are really tired at this point in the semester, and it's meaningful to make that time to reach all of our students. So thank you. 
So you got our, our long version of our introductions already. Thank you, Anwar. Um, but this is our short version. Um, this is my esteemed colleague, Suzanne. As you can see, the DENSLO coordinator steering team. She's facilitated all these wonderful classes for CVC and at one. She's co-designed equitable grading, been an ASCCC OERI project facilitator, and then the DECO executive team. So Thank you so much for co-presenting with me, Suzanne. It's been so nice getting to know you. Um, I work at Los Angeles Mission College and uh, we're that's part of the Los Angeles Community College District. Uh, I'm the chair of English Comm Studies and Journalism there. And I am a DE facilitator for some of our accessibility courses. And I wrote a very, very short book called Captioning Made Easy. Here's a basic overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, and before I go into this, I'll, I'll uh, go into this list. I do want to do a little bit of a sidebar about when you would use documents. Um, but after we get, talk about that, um, because there are so many types of documents, right? There's, of course, a Word document. There's a PowerPoint. There's a PDF. Um, there's no way that we can cover all of the elements of all of them in 90 minutes. Um, so we're going to devote the bulk of our time to Word because a lot of the same principles can then be applied to PowerPoint and PDF. And then we'll give you sort of, uh, Suzanne will give you a little bit of an overview of those last two forms. Um, but we encourage you, if you are really interested in PowerPoint and PDF, to do a deep dive because... PDF especially, you could spend many days learning it. So that's what we have on the agenda. Um, before we hop into Word, um, one of the things that I think is really important to sort of frame this conversation is when do we actually use documents? So as an English professor, when I started teaching, I always used documents in Canvas. I love Word. Word. I love documents and formatting and all these things. And um, it took me a while to realize that in many cases, Canvas pages are actually a better choice for a lot of content. Um, you may have heard this before. Um, if you haven't, you might wonder, well, why? And there's a couple of different reasons. But one of the things is that a Canvas page is um, basically HTML or a web page. So it's going to adapt to lots of different device sizes. Uh, for instance, the last statistic I saw was that one out of four Americans are smartphone dependent, which means they don't necessarily have a computer at home. And so they're viewing our content on a very small screen. If we're putting it in pages, they can use the student app. Um, it'll adjust to the size of their device. Um, in addition, it's usually easier to make Canvas pages more accessible. Um, everything stored in the cloud um, versus uploading, downloading different versions, things like that, really easy to edit. So um, if you have documents and you look at it and you say, okay, I have this on a Word page, but really it doesn't need to be in a Word page. In those situations, we would encourage you to just make it a Canvas page because a Word document is a little bit harder to make accessible. It's possible, but it's harder. Um, same thing for PowerPoint and PDF. So when you can put something into a Canvas page, do that. Um, there will be cases when you do need a Word document and or a PowerPoint, and that's what this presentation is all about. Um, but really, before you start retrofitting every old document you have under the sun, really ask yourself, what documents do I critically need to stay as documents rather than being converted to a Canvas page? Um, and if it doesn't have to be a document, instead spend that time putting it into a Canvas page. And then one other note that we just wanted to share is that sometimes you will get things from publishers. It might be, you know, teaching resources to support a textbook. Those materials are not always accessible, even though you think they would be. <clears throat> so it's important to check documents you get from a publisher. If they're not accessible, you really have two options. Um, the first is to reach out to the publisher and say, hey, do you have an accessible version? Um, 
a couple of different times when I've done that, the publisher has said, oh, you downloaded, you know, something a couple of years ago, and now we have an accessible version. Here it is. That's great. Um, but there may be other times when they say, sorry, we don't. And then you'll have to make it um, an accessible document. So just kind of a preface to getting into the nitty gritty here. All right. So let's dive into a couple of the things that can make our Word documents uh, more accessible. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is headings. Um, and as we think about this, um, well, with accessibility in general, you know, sometimes we'll think about um, how will this help somebody who is, you know, for instance, visually impaired or blind who's using a screen reader. And that's a really important person to consider. We need our content to be accessible to everyone. Um, but one of the things I've found getting into accessibility is that the things that I do to help those who might have, you know, vision issues actually tends to help everyone. And headings are a really good example of this. Um, this is why sometimes you'll you'll hear of UDL, universal design, and, um, and thinking about how we can structure um, our content so it reaches everyone. It's universally accessible to everyone. So why is that true with headings? Um, so this has something to do with the human brain, and I'm not a scientist, so uh, please accept my layman's terms of the human brain. Um, but we have limits to our short-term memory, and it is a struggle to retain everything we read if there aren't breaks for our brain. And some of the things that provide breaks are white space, headings, and bullets. So with headings, um, what it basically does is headings will chunk your page into more brain-friendly bites of information. Um, and what you want your headings to do is also be read by a screen reader. Um, if you haven't seen um, a demonstration of a screen reader before, I encourage you to Google it, uh, find one on YouTube after this session. But basically, if I um, had a visual disability, I could use a screen reader to read every word on the page to me. Um, but now imagine, you know, I'm an English person. Let's imagine I'm in chemistry, which is not my strong suit. And I'm listening to paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of information on something that I don't find easy to retain. That's going to be really challenging for me without headings that are going to break up that information. Um, so when we're thinking about our um, documents, um, and this would also be true of a Canvas page, right? But it will be true of Word. We want to use headings that will break up that information and not only will it help someone who's listening to our content with a screen reader, but it will also help our students who don't have a visual um, struggle, but who are trying to absorb really difficult material. So we want that heavy lifting, the cognitive load to be on learning the hard things we teach, not on interpreting big giant paragraphs of text. So our headings are going to provide structure to a page for our sighted students, but they will also help our students who are using screen readers to navigate the content. Now, a mistake that I made early on when I was, uh, before I did all my accessibility learning was I would just make my headings a really big font, maybe make it bold. The problem with that is that your, your sighted students will be able to say, oh, that's a heading, um, but a screen reader will not recognize that as a heading. So that's why when you're in Word, you're going to use styles to denote headings. And in a minute, I'm going to show you screenshots. So Suzanne has a PC and I have a Mac. So we each took screenshots of what our most recent software shows us so you can see what it looks like. Um, but one other thing I wanted to note was I saw a study from WebAIM recently that said it asked people, what is the first thing you do when you see a web page to kind of navigate the content? Uh, and I think something like 70 or 75% of people said they look at headings. So if you think about first time you look at a website, there's a lot of information. What do you do? A lot of times you scroll the headings. Um, and as an English teacher, when we teach active reading for a textbook, we tell students, look for the headings first. So these things will really help anchor that information. They're very brain friendly. They help our students understand the material. Um, so to help all your students get the most from headings, 
Um, you want to make sure they're logical. Um, they need to describe what's underneath and they should be concise. So you don't want a heading that's, you know, two sentences long. Usually a couple words is fine. Um, and I, one word I sometimes use is hierarchical. So it's, it's sort of like heading one is the main title or the big boss um, of the page. And then heading two are the main topics underneath. So let's say I was teaching a class on food. Um, maybe heading one would be food. Um, heading two might be vegetables, fruits, and meats. And then heading three is going to be the subtopics for heading two. So if I have a subhead or heading two is fruits, heading three might be apples, oranges, berries, things like that. And then you don't want to skip levels. So if you skip from heading one to heading three, um, it's confusing, especially to a student on a screen reader. So this is what it looks like in Windows. Um, you want to highlight the text that you're planning to use as a heading, or you can place your cursor within the text. Then from the Home tab, you're looking for the heading styles. So you can see on Windows here, it looks like an A with a paintbrush. And then once you hit that little arrow, um, you can see heading one, heading two, and you can click those. Um, and that's how you'll make it a heading in a way that a screen reader can recognize it. Similar in Word, highlight the text, look for an A with a paintbrush. Sometimes if your window's big enough, it'll just show you those styles of the normal, heading one, heading two. But if you ever can't see it, look for the heading button um, with this little arrow, and then it will break out into more options. Um, hopefully you'll have access to this presentation afterwards. Um, but we also put in some links for additional resources. And we separated Windows and, and Mac because, as you all know, sometimes it can be a little bit different. Okay. So going back to that idea of we have these, you know, brains, right, that neuroscience tells us we'd love to just be able to absorb everything, but our brains don't work that way, right? They only have this much, I mean, figuratively, you know, space for short-term information before they need time to kind of store it into long-term memory. So we need white space. We need things like bullets. We need things like headings that are going to help our students absorb the material more readily. So lists are a great way to um, create more white space. Um, so they also present related ideas. Um, they can illustrate items in a group or they can outline steps in a process. So um, you can use either bullets or numbers. If you're ever wondering when to use which, um, think about whether order actually matters. If the order of the list matters, that should be the time when you use numbers such as steps like Step one, walk to your car. Step two, unlock it. Step three, right where the order matters. If it's just a list like vegetables, um, why can't I think of any vegetables? Okay, broccoli, you know, my brain just is like vegetable free right now. But imagine I had more and each of them was a bullet. Um, that's, that's what you could do for something where um, the order doesn't matter. So um, similar to what we were saying, lists are going to capitalize on white space because there's they create more white space. And what that does is allows our brains and our students' brains to really take a deep breath and sort of absorb um, that material. So we definitely encourage you to use them. However, it is important how we actually format them. So remember on the last part we said with headings, we sometimes are tempted, like, I'll just use a big font and a different color and bold it, but that's not going to tell a screen reader that that's a heading. Similarly, sometimes when we're new to accessibility studies, we want to make a list using things like dashes, or we want to just type one dash, two dash. Um, those things are not going to tell a screen reader that it's a list. So it's important that when you do use a list, that you use the list feature, um, and there, and you'll be, you'll, you'll see it in Word, you'll see it in Canvas Pages. It, it looks kind of similar across a lot of different um, design platforms where you're designing text, um, but there will be a little menu where you can choose either bullets or numbers, 
And if you do it that way, you're telling Word that you want it to be a list and it will also read that way to a screen reader. So just as an example of what that would look like. So here's our Windows version. So once you're on the Home tab, you, you'll probably have a list of items, right? And you can separate each of them by hitting Return so that they're each on a different line. Then you highlight them and you can hopefully see in this image um, that there's an option that kind of looks like bullets. So in this, um, in the in the Windows one, it kind of looks like little boxes with the lines. Um, and then next to it is the one, two, three with the line. So you would click either of those depending on whether you wanted bullets or whether you wanted a numbered list. And if you do it that way, then it will tell a screen reader properly um, that you're making a list. So you can choose either of those depending on the use. Remember, only use numbers when the order matters. Um, similarly, for a Mac, um, you're going to do the exact same thing. Separate your items that you want in the bulleted list by hitting return. So they're each on a different line. And you can see there's a similar thing in the home um, tab for Word in Mac. Um, that there's the three dots with lines, and then there's the one, two, three. And for instance, if you want your bullets to look different, maybe you want boxes and or check marks, that's where that little arrow um, over here next to the dots with lines, um, you could hit that and you would see other options. Um, you can also find other options for numbering if, for instance, you wanted a Roman numeral type um, scenario. And then a couple more resources for you to check out. Okay, so another thing that's going to be really important in your Word document is your links, um, also known as URLs. And a lot of us have become, you know, really good at sharing resources with students. And that's great because there's wonderful things out there on the web that we can link them to and that we want to share with them. Um, but one of the um, struggles um, that can be presented is if you are viewing, uh, or I guess listening, um, uh, or, or you're using a, a screen reader technology um, that's reading the page to you, um, that screen reader, first of all, if you just put a giant link like HTTP, you know, www. Um, the screen reader will he read the whole link. And you know that can be a giant link sometimes. Sometimes the link will be four or five lines long. Um, but beyond that, um, the screen reader is actually going to create a links list. So if you look at this example here on the right, um, it says links list, and this is exactly what it would look like from a screen reader. So you can see in this example, it says, send them to HTCTU staff, view the memorial service for Carl Brown, www.apple.com. So for a student using a screen reader, they suddenly have a, a list of all the links. And this is how they're going to be able to navigate to them. Because for a student who you know doesn't have any um, vision issues, they can just look for the blue and the underline. Those are kind of our cues um, for sighted viewers that this is a link. But that becomes harder when you have a, a vision disability. Um, and so the links list helps them navigate through the links. The problem is that sometimes we use really vague text for links. So maybe we know we're not supposed to do www four lines of a URL, but we think, okay, I'll make the list or I'll make the link click here or read more, right? But the problem is once you pull that into a link list, you suddenly you could have click here, read more, uh, check this out, right? That doesn't tell someone who's using a screen reader what they're actually clicking on. And it becomes very confusing for them to try to navigate um, between the links because you haven't actually told them what that link leads to. Um, so that's why we're going to use something called descriptive links. So a descriptive link is one that identifies the purpose of the link um, and it makes it easier for an individual to navigate. So um, if we're looking, for example, at the link list, which is on this slide as well, Carl Brown Scholarship, 
I would think is a pretty good descriptive link because you could guess that if you click on that, you're going to learn more about the scholarship. Um, read more about the Carl Brown scholarship is really too long for the link. Uh, you really just need Carl Brown scholarship. You can see kind of both of them are there. Um, the www.apple.com doesn't really tell you much. Um, job opportunity is okay. It's uh, If you had multiple job opportunities on one page, you might want to go into more detail. Um, but you, you're basically trying to describe in a few words concisely what will happen when a student clicks this link. What are they going to see? And you want it to make sense even if that link is pulled completely out of its context into a link list like this one here. So whenever you're using links, try not to use straight URLs um, and also don't use the same descriptive link more than once. If I keep saying Carl Brown Scholarship, Carl Brown Scholarship, it's going to be confusing to see the same thing linked three or four different times, right? So you're going to try to use a couple of words that make it clear what's going to open um, and that's going to help keep the document accessible. Um, so. Hopefully that's a good overview of that. So how do you do this? I feel like our screenshots here are a little bit, um, there's more, a little more complicated, but it's just because it, it's quite fast once you get used to it. Um, but basically you're going to get the URL of the website to which you're linking. Um, so you're going to copy it. And then you are going to think about what your descriptive phrase is. So in this screenshot, um, the descriptive phrase is classes on accessibility. So you can see that it's highlighted. Um, now in Windows, um, you're going to go to insert from the menu bar. So you can see that's kind of where the first arrow is. And then once you're on the insert, you can go to that little link. And I always think it looks kind of like a little, two little chain links. Um, so you click on the link and then uh, in, the option comes up to insert link. And then you can paste in the address. So if you're looking at this Windows box, it says insert hyperlink, text to display. So that's our descriptive text, classes on accessibility. And that came in, would have come in directly because the person highlighted it. And then where you would copy and paste in is address. And that's just the link. And so once you hit OK, classes on accessibility will become a hyperlink, blue with the underline, and it will link to that address. Similarly, on a Mac, you are going to go to link, um, highlight the phrase that you want to be your descriptive link, um, hit insert. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, make sure you copy the URL of the website you're about to use. Highlight the phrase, just like we, I, we showed in the last one that you want to be your descriptive link. Select insert from the menu bar, so it's similar. Um, select a link and then put in the URL to address and hit okay. So we have a couple more resources here. Hopefully those will be helpful. So, so far we've covered headings, lists, and what did we just do? I blanked on it. Hyperlinks. Okay. So the, the fourth thing that you want to think about with your Word document is using alternative text for your images. So the reason you're going to need alternative text is because someone um, with low vision or who could be blind, they're not going to be able to see the image. And if that image has pedagogical content, then they're not getting the exact same experience as a student who is cited. And so we need to fix that. And the way that we can fix that is by providing alternative text. Um, so to ensure your document is accessible, it's important to add a text description to the images. This allows individuals who are visually impaired in using screen reader software to hear the description of the image. And um, that description is called alternative text and it's also known as alt text and it is required um, under accessibility laws and regulations. So make sure that you put it in. However, there are cases where you won't need it. 
which is what we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, when you are thinking about the alternative text for an image, it's really important to think about the pedagogical value of the image. So if I'm doing an English page on, on MLA and I just put a picture of a flower, that flower isn't teaching anything about MLA. It's just there to make the, the page look pretty. So that flower doesn't have pedagogical value. Um, in that case, I don't need to provide alt text. I just need to tell in Word, tell it to mark it as decorative. Um, it's a decorative image. There's no learning happening when you look at the flower. Um, but there will be cases when your images have pedagogical value, but it might differ between classes. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have an image of um, Elvis Presley performing. Um, and one of the classes is like a, a fashion class and it's illustrating what his performance costume looked like um, for a page on um, performance outfits. Um, then the alternative text might say, you know, Elvis Presley wearing a leather jacket, right? It might focus on what he's wearing. <clears throat> um, in a historical class, it, it might say it, Elvis Presley performing at blank venue in um, 19 blah, 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 right? Because maybe it's it's a class that's explaining the history of, of, of song or rock and roll or American music. And in a class that's about performance, it might say, you know, Elvis Presley leaning forward, gripping the microphone, right? So we could all look at the same image of Elvis Presley, but how it's being used in the page to further learning is what's going to help you choose the alternative text. So um, ask yourself what pedagogical value, what teaching value is this giving students, if any? And if it is giving pedagogical value, how can I describe that very concisely? Um, another thing that's important to note is that a screen reader will already say image of before an image. So you don't want to start your description with image of, because then it will say image of, image of, right? It'll be redundant. Um, you only need to identify the type of image being used if it's relevant. So for instance, um, I'm let's say I'm teaching an art class and I need students to know that it's a photograph or a painting, or I'm doing an instructional um, guide and I need people to know it's a screenshot. Then you can say it, but otherwise don't use image of. You also want to keep a couple things in mind. The first thing is when possible, and it's not always possible, but when possible, keep the alternative text brief. So just a general rule of thumb is 10 words or less. That is not going to always be possible. But when possible, be more concise. Sometimes you'll put in an image that has text content. So maybe I, for instance, as an English teacher, I have a visual aid about the, the writing process and there's boxes with, you know, pre-writing, brainstorming, drafting. Um, if my image has words in it, I should try to include that exact text in the alternative text box. Um, otherwise, usually the, that pedagogical value isn't one-to-one. -one. It isn't sort of being communicated to a student using a screen reader. Um, there are also cases, and I feel like this happens a lot in the in STEM, but sometimes in other fields, where the image is very detailed and not cannot be summarized in a few sentences. So, you know, sometimes when I lead my class uh, course on creating accessible content for LACCD, I'll get, you know, a science professor who says, I have a, you know, basically a chart of the human body where 40 things are labeled. Right. And so for me to, to convey that to a student using a screen reader is going to take a lot of words. And that's absolutely true. There are things that can be very, very complex. Um, so one of the things you can do is explain the image in the text that's right before or right after the image. Um, and that can usually um, help. And that also can be a best practice um, with universal design. Um, because those complex images can be difficult for a variety of students, not just those using screen readers. So in Windows, you would 
to add alternative text or alt text, um, you would select the image. So usually you can just click on it once. Um, you would go to the picture format menu on that top bar and select alt text. And then you can go ahead and write in the alt text that you feel is, um, is appropriate for the image. And um, I don't ever recommend using generate alt text for me because AI is not going to know um, what the pedagogical value is. So go ahead and type in what you think is right. Unless, like I was saying earlier, the image is completely decorative. It's just there to make the page look pretty. So you can see underneath generate alt text for me, that little box. So we have the person in the screenshot. Um, we have dog in a mushroom fairy ring. And then underneath generate alt text for me, which we're not going to click. But hopefully you can also see a checkbox there that says mark as decorative. So that is what you would check if you have something that's merely on your um, document to make it look pretty. So you, maybe you have stars or somebody doing a thumbs up or, you know, anything else that's just there for visual interest, not for learning purposes, then you can mark it as decorative. Similarly, uh, in the Mac, you can select your image. Um, and then what I usually do is right click the image. And then this uh, menu comes up here where I can choose view alt text. And then similarly to the Windows version, I can type in my alternative text or if it's just flowers to make the page look pretty, my, um, my document look pretty, then I could mark it as decorative. And then we have a couple more links here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking here at the chat. Oh, I see Suzanne's answering them. Okay, great. So these are great questions um, about alt text. But yes, if you have any image in a document, you need to um, tell uh, a screen reader that it's um, whether you need to either provide alternative text or mark it as decorative. You don't want to do nothing at all. Um, so make sure you do one or the other for either of those images. And I would say with any time I've gone back and I fixed my documents, the first few times it can take a while. But um, after that, I, I start to get a, a workflow that's pretty fast just from having done it a few times. So even if it feels laborious the first time or two, um, you'll, it, you'll get faster at it. Um, I also, even though I'm not a STEM person, I work a lot with STEM instructors. And I know that you, uh, many of you as STEM instructors or other fields face, you know, special obstacles to trying to uh, describe your very complex images and charts. So I put in a couple of links, uh, hopefully just to help with that process and to make it a little bit easier for you to um, read more about that. Because that is, that could be its own webinar that's a little beyond the scope of what we're doing, but we do recognize that there are more complex cases out there. Um, okay, so text styles and colors. So whenever you're creating content, um, less is more. Um, it reminds, sometimes I think back to the early days of the internet, which maybe some of you are too young to remember, but uh, the text would just, sometimes you would go to a web page and it would just be like 50 different text, like fonts and colors. And you're just like, what? Like trying to read it. And, you know, it, even though those pages were fun in a way, they were also really chaotic. Um, and all those visual flares add cognitive load, right? Because now my brain's trying not only to read the words, it's trying to decipher all the different fonts. And now it's blue and now it's green and now it's purple. And instead of just focusing on the words. So a little visual flare once in a while is probably fine, but try to not go overboard because then the brain starts worrying about things other than absorbing the content. Now it's just trying to navigate the five, six, seven, eight fonts that we used and oh my goodness, so many colors. So um, just try to be, uh, remember less is more. Um, even though it might look cool to have so many different fonts, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to read and understand the content. Um, the other thing to remember is that you don't want to use color as the sole means of conveying meaning. 
Um, and this is because, you know, there are visual disabilities like low vision or being blind, but there's also people who are colorblind who may not be able to differentiate um, between colors the way that someone who isn't colorblind um, can. So you don't want to use color as a sole mean of conveying meaning. And you also want to avoid fancy scripts because again, my brain is sitting here just trying to read the letters instead of letting my brain absorb whatever the content is. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm going, the last thing I'm going to cover before I hand it over to Suzanne is tables, um, which can be a little bit complex, but I'm just going to give you an overview. Um, Tables are for data, not formatting. What I mean by that is that when I first started teaching, I would use tables a lot to organize information that wasn't wasn't really data. Like here's what's due on week one, here's what's due on week two. And I would use a table to make it look pretty for, for formatting purposes, but it didn't actually convey data. Um, and the reason you want to not use it for formatting is you're going to try to put yourself in the mind of someone who is listening to all your content with a screen reader. Um, so imagine they cannot see the grid, the table, and they are just hearing content being read. Imagine how hard it might be to absorb that, right? So we don't want to make uh, our information any harder to absorb than it already is, because a lot of us teach, you know, difficult topics already. Um, so you don't want to use tables for formatting because you're adding cognitive load when you don't need to. So for instance, for me, I used to have a chart that said week one and then the homework, but I didn't have to show, put that in a, uh, I mean, a table. I didn't have to put that in a table. I could just make a heading that said week one homework and then bullets that said what was due. Um, so if you're using tables solely for formatting, please um, consider that you might there might be another way to arrange that information. Um, however, there are times when we have to use tables to communicate data. Um, and when that is the case, you want your students to be able to use the table easily. Um, and you want it to be formatted so that someone with a screen reader um, can understand the material. And so part of that includes uh, denoting the table header row. Um, and that's basically um, the, the row that's functioning as the title of each column and telling you what's in it so that the screen reader knows how to read the chart. Um, and the header row allows the screen uh, reader to keep track of where it is within the table. And that's really important to a visually impaired student who is just hearing you know, a lot of numbers um, in, in a table. So um, you want to make sure you, you set that up. So I'll show you in a minute a screenshot. But one other thing I would just like to say about tables um, is to maximize the clarity of a table. A couple of things to avoid. Um, the first thing is a table within a table, which is called a nested table. Accessibility nightmare, please avoid. Um, another thing that you can do is split a cell, and that can be very confusing to a screen reader. You can also merge cells, which again is confusing to a screen reader, as, as well as having empty cells with nothing in them. So you want to avoid all those things. Avoid nested tables, split cells, merge cells, empty cells. You want your um, table to be as straightforward as possible, and you want it to be primarily used for data. So I hope that was sort of a helpful start. And I think I'm ready to pass it off to you, Suzanne. Does that sound right? Okay. Absolutely. Um, there were some really great questions in the chat. So I'm going to pause for a moment and answer, answer those. Um, but let me go ahead and screen share. Okay, so I have been answering the questions in the chat, but I also wanted to get get these on the recording. One of the, the questions was um, confirming that in general, it's better to use Canvas pages than documents. Um, and, and yes, confirming <laughs> Canvas pages is the way to go. 
Um, another question that came up was if uh, when you set the heading to in Canvas, it makes the fonts really big, um, which I, I agree, it feels really large to me. And the question was, should I just make that a heading three instead? Because that's a nicer size. And the answer to that is no. Don't skip heading levels. Keep it as a heading two. Um, technically, once you set it as a heading two, you can change the font size to make it smaller if it feels really big. Um, but one of the things I want to make into a bumper sticker, it says, uh, don't mess with the defaults. Because as soon as you mess with the defaults, other things can break. So a student may have their browser set in a certain way to help them with vision issues. And as soon as you hard code the size of something, their browser settings can no longer adapt. So it's one of those where to us, it may feel way too big, but um, it'll be fine. <laughs> Just kind of leave it as is, is, is my general recommendation. Okay. Um, and then the last question I think is worth addressing is um, the question about how to avoid using tables. And it's it's a really tricky thing. If you have information that feels like it it's, makes more sense in a table, then you can use tables. What we were trying to get at is don't use tables for, for formatting. Oftentimes what I've seen is where instructors want to use the table so that the picture is on the right side and the text is on the left side, and that's the only way I know how to get them to line up. That's not data, right? Um, so avoid that, but use tables when it makes sense, right? Like if you have a list of, of assignments and a list of points and, and you want that in a table format, but also um, lists can be a really good way to um, a really good alternative to tables. They can be more accessible, easier to read. Tables also have extra lines, which is just more visual load on our brains. And so oftentimes we, we think we need a table, but a list may be the answer. Okay, so I think I've addressed all of the questions in the chat. If you have questions, please continue to post them in the chat and um, Karen will answer them. I am going to now ignore the chat because as we discussed, cognitive load is a thing and I'm focused on, um, on this session. So what we're going to move on to next was actually a question that was asked about if I find a document, how can I make sure it's accessible? And that's where accessibility checkers come in. I would also encourage you when you've created a document, once you're done creating it, even if you've gone through and you've been following all the um, guidance that we've been providing, um, run the accessibility checker. I, I have yet to finish a document where I haven't like missed an alt text or something, right? Like just run the checker to double confirm that you've done everything correctly. However, um, oh, and I should make, uh, make sure to say, have an, a current version of Word or um, Microsoft, because the older versions, the accessibility checkers aren't as good so that um, you'll definitely want to have the newer versions of all of these when we talk about PDFs and everything, that's where you're going to get the best accessibility checker. However, automation can't fix everything. Someday, maybe, but not yet. And the example Karen gave about alt text, I think is the cleanest example of how would the accessibility checker know why you're showing this picture of Elvis, right? Like they, there's no way that we can automate it. The checker will tell you if you have alt text, but it can't tell you if your alt text is good. Similarly, um, the, the checker can tell you if your um, text has sufficient contrast. So if it's dark enough to be able, um, so, so folks can read it but it can't tell you if you're using color to indicate meaning, right? And it, it can't tell you if the hyperlink text you've chosen is good, um, meaningful text. So there are some things that the accessibility checker just can't do. Um, however, it's always worth running, running it because there's a lot of things that it can do that we sometimes just miss because, you know, we're human and why not? 
finding the accessibility checker. Uh, one of the, the things that I just made me so happy with the newest version of um, Microsoft for Windows is the accessibility checker used to be so hidden. It was like three or four clicks away. And they finally moved it right to the, uh, the main screen. So across the top is the review tab. And in the review tab is the accessibility checker. It looks like a, a piece of paper with a, a little person standing there. So that's the accessibility checker. When you click on that, you can see on the right side of this image, that'll open up a new window, which will um, identify any accessibility issues that it finds. If you click the, the little carrot next to each issue, it'll explain why, why it matters, why it's an issue, which is really kind of cool, because then we're using this as not just to confirm that we're doing things well, but also as a way to, um, to learn more about why these things matter. I know that was a question in the chat earlier. Um, what does doing, what does not having accessible documents do for students using screen readers? This will give you that sort of information, which is cool. It'll also take you to places where you can fix the issue, which um, is very helpful. Similarly, on a Mac, same thing, you find the review tab and then you look for the accessibility checker, again, a piece of paper, and I thought it was a person. It seems to be a clock of some sort. Anyway, it says accessibility checker, which is a giveaway. And here are additional resources. The question in the chat from the, early on was, will you get a link to these slides? And yes, the same, um, place where you registered for the webinar will have recordings and these slides. And we encourage you to click on those links so that you can get more information um, because we're covering a lot of information in, um, in a very short period of time. This may also be a good time to pause and remind you that I'm gonna put actually a link in the chat as Karen was, um, was presenting, it occurred to me, one of the things we didn't have on our slides is a link to um, the At One course where you can um, spend four weeks on accessibility, right? So 90 minutes, so not a lot of time. This is just a kind of intro. So if you want more information, the At One class is amazing. And the CCC Accessibility Center has a whole bunch of just wonderful resources, including a, um, a full self-paced class just on creating accessible documents. So it's this, but you get to do a, a deep dive into, um, into the, the topics. So highly encourage you to bookmark those because I don't think the chat comes through in the recordings, um, but definitely worth taking both of those opportunities. Okay, so that is um, accessibility checkers. As we mentioned at the beginning, um, we spent most of the session just on Word, and that's because accessibility um, rules apply across the board. So in, in the chat, folks were asking about Canvas. How do I do alt text in Canvas? Very similar. You're looking for the same kind of things, right? The list item looks the same across most platforms. The link icon, all of these things are very similar. So we were using Word as a... Um, a, a place to demonstrate all of the, the criteria, which are pretty much the same. So for PowerPoint, um, kind of the same as Word, as I've been saying. All text, same sort of thing. And because it's a Microsoft product, the, um, the icons will look very similar. There was a question about Google. The strategies for um, doing this in Google, again, are very similar. The icons look very similar. Um, one of the, not going to badmouth Google, but one of the issues with Google is it doesn't have an accessibility checker, which is an issue. You can download a plugin called Grackle, um, which is okay. It has a paid version, which is better. Um, all of that is to say everything we're showing you here for Word is very similar across pretty much any kind of um, platform you're using. So alt text is the same, hyperlinks, the rules for hyperlinks, lists, headers for tables, accessibility checker, all very, very similar for PowerPoint. 
additional considerations for PowerPoint, just because the format itself is quite different, is that um, you want to stick with the pre-designed themes. So this is back to the bumper sticker, don't mess with the defaults, right? If you go into PowerPoint, there are themes that it has where it'll, it's already set what the heading is going to be, it's set the reading order, it's set how things are presented. It can be really tempting to, to like add text boxes and move things around. Um, just don't leave it as the, as it is um, when, it, when, when, when possible, right? Like there are times when things have to be shifted. And when you do that, just make sure you're double checking on the accessibility checker. Okay. So all of this here is just to say the pre-designed themes are really the, the best way to go because those are going to be your most accessible. Okay. So two, two of the major do's and don'ts for PowerPoint, um, specifically in addition to what we've been talking about in general before. Do give each slide a unique title. So you'll notice on our slides, we had a few slides that were talking about headings and a few slides that were talking about alt text. It's really tempting to just have five slides where the title is all headings. If you're using a screen reader, that can be really confusing because you don't know which of the five heading slides you're on, right? So try to give each slide a unique title. So notice for ours, we had, you know, creating headings in Microsoft, creating headings in Mac. So it's descriptive, it's clear, there's no confusion. Sometimes if it's the same information across two slides, you might just wanna say something like headings parentheses one, headings parentheses two. But you definitely wanna make sure the titles are unique and that they're descriptive. As I mentioned, don't add text boxes. If you wanna have more, um, content on the slide, look through the theme and find the, um, the slide format that is most similar to what you wanna do. You can add text boxes, but if you do, you wanna be really careful to run the accessibility checker and make sure things are read in the correct order. Because one of the um, oddities of Microsoft, and it, it's maybe because the way computers work, they don't know that we intend content to be read top left to bottom right, right? So if I'm adding a text box in the bottom right, I think it's going to be read at the end. The way uh, PowerPoint reads the text boxes is in the order that they were created, which is just not how we think about content on a slide, right? So that's something to be um, to be careful about. So let's take a look at how to run the accessibility checker in PowerPoint. As I mentioned, very similar to Word, you're going to find the review tab, and then you're gonna look for the little accessibility checker icon. And when you do that, it'll run the accessibility checker, the pop-up window will look the same as it did in Word, so we didn't have additional slides for that. But what we did want to show specifically is reading order, because that tends to not be an issue in Word. But in PowerPoint, it can be a really uh, major issue. So to check the reading order, you're going to, again, go to the Review tab. But rather than clicking on the Accessibility Checker itself, you want to look for the little carrot next to the Accessibility Checker. And the dropdown that, that you'll get from there has an item that says reading order. Once you have the reading order uh, tab open, so you can see at the bottom of the screen here is a slide with the reading order panel on the right side. Once you have that panel open, I would encourage you to go through all of your slides and make sure the reading order makes sense, especially if you've added text boxes. If you've just used the default and not changed anything, you, you wouldn't really need to do this because it's all predetermined. But I like to just double check everything and it goes pretty quickly to just click through the slides. What's really cool about the way um, Microsoft has the reading order box is you can see each of the items and when you click on an item, it highlights it on the slide, right? So the first item is the title, you can see it highlighted here. 
if this is not the first thing I want to read, want read on the slide, which the title would be the first thing I wanted read. But if something was out of order, you can just click and drag that item up and down on this list. If there's something that shouldn't be read by the screen reader, so some sort of decorative image that isn't relevant, you can uncheck the little box next to the, the item. So it makes it really ordered, uh, easy to reorder content on the slide. And these are additional PowerPoint resources. Okay. Before we go on to, to PDF, Karen, was there anything in the, the chat about PowerPoint in specific? No, I think we're we're good to go. The only one that um, I was just about to answer was Alicia was saying, what if I've checked reading order and confirm all is good in good order? What can I do if I still get this message in PowerPoint? And if I'm remembering correctly, it's um, it's a, it's encouraging you to do a manual check. So there's not really a way to clear it. Is that what you're understanding too, Suzanne? Yep, that, yeah, I think so. Um, and the question, is there a way to fix Word and PowerPoint files supplied by publishers? Um, you, you can. Um, fixing publisher content can be a little tricky for um, copyright reasons, which is a whole other kettle of fish that is not the focus of this presentation. Um, so whether or not um, you can has, has different answers, but technically you should be able to. And if you find content that is not accessible from a publisher, um, your options are to fix it or to just not use it, right? Like we, even if it's from a publisher, we can't give them a pass and say, well, I didn't create it, therefore it doesn't have to be accessible. Um, and oftentimes we just assume publishers have accessible content because we've paid them lots of money. Um, and that is not a fair assumption. Um, but to Karen's point earlier, uh, it's worth reaching out to them. They may have accessible content elsewhere that I haven't found. So definitely that is the best step is to reach out to the publishers. Excellent. Okay, oops, PDF. So let's talk about PDFs. I'm gonna start at the bottom bullet point here um, because it's something we've said uh, numerous times. So I'm gonna say just one more time. Canvas pages are your best bet. So you really wanna ask yourself if a PDF is necessary. In general, um, the, the, the main reason people want PDFs is if they're meant to be printed. So if it's something I expect students to print out, then a PDF is the way to go because Word documents get all funky when they download and print them. Um, but if I'm not expecting students to print them out, there's very few good reasons to have PDFs. Uh, one of the additional challenges with PDFs is on a phone, um, it's non-responsive. So if you've ever opened a PDF on your phone, it's this tiny thing and then you like zoom way in and you have to scroll to read and then drop down and scroll. So PDFs are quite problematic and you wanna ask yourself, do I need it? But there are times where you may need it. And so we wanted to make sure to cover how to make them um, accessible. So the place to begin is when you create the document, you're not gonna create it generally in um, Adobe. You're going to create it in Word and then transfer it over into Adobe or in PowerPoint and transfer over as a PDF. The first step is to make sure that the original document is accessible. So you've run the accessibility checker, you've fixed any issues, you've double checked everything, and then convert it to a PDF. Because any accessibility issues in the original document are going to carry over. But even if you've made sure that your original document is accessible, when you transition over to PDF, new accessibility issues may come to the surface. In general, anytime you move from one modality to another, accessibility issues can, can come in. There's just weird things that happen in general. So for example, if you have your Word files and, and you're like, I'm on board, I'm going to make them into Canvas pages. What I encourage folks to do is rather than just cut and paste from Word into Canvas, because weird 
tags come through. It's like magic in the background. I don't know what's happening. The best way to do that is to copy from Word into a program like um, Notepad. And I forget what it's called in, in, in Max, but it's a program that's text only and it strips out all the coding. Then copy from that into Canvas and then set your headings and your lists and whatever else it is. That's the cleanest way to make sure that no um, kind of ghost tags come along. Okay. So once you've converted your document into a PDF, you wanna run the PDF, uh, the Adobe Accessibility Checker to make sure that there's no new um, issues that have come about. So let's talk about how to convert from Windows, um, from, sorry, from Word into PDF. When you click Save As, you're going to select um, PDF, but, and here's the key, you wanna make sure to click the Options button. Because when you click the Options button, that opens a new window where you can make sure that the box that says Document Structure Tags for Accessibility and PDF A compliant boxes are checked. Because what those two things will do is it'll make sure that the, the tags that you have in Word carry over appropriately to PDF. Similarly, if you're converting from Word to PDF in a Mac, you're gonna select Save As um, and then choose PDF and make sure that the, the little radio button underneath that says best for electronic distribution and accessibility is checked. And then select export. So once you've transitioned something into PDF, you wanna make sure to run the accessibility checker. And to do that, you're going to go to tools and scroll through tools until you find the little person in the circle. Um, it looks just like the Canvas Accessibility Checker icon, right? So you're going to find the Accessibility Tool, click on that, and that'll open um, in your toolbar on the main document. You'll now see the Accessibility icon. When you click on that, select Check Accessibility. That'll open a new window. You can leave the defaults set, so don't worry about checking or unchecking things. This is, is set pretty well. And then choose start selecting. Sorry, start checking. That will open a new panel on the left side. So you can see here, this is my um, PDF document. There's a new panel in red on the left side. And this will show me all of the accessibility issues on the PDF. What's really cool about this is you can fix many of these by, by clicking on them and it'll take you right to the place to fix them. Like for alt text, it'll take you to a window where you can fix the alt text if it's missing. What's less cool are other things are super difficult to fix. Things like headings and tags require you to, to go into other places in Adobe that are just, I mean, they're, it's it's challenging. Let me just say that. I wish I could say it nicer, but it takes some skill and it takes some time. And I generally avoid it at all costs. In fact, if your um, PDF is particularly uh, troublesome, oftentimes the best thing to do is to go back to the original Word file, fix everything there, and then resave it as a PDF. And that takes care of a lot of the issues. So I think I've already mentioned this, retrofitting PDFs is challenging. Go back to Word, that'll take care of most of the issue. If you don't have the original PDF, uh, sorry, the original Word file, you can convert a PDF into Word. Um, it ain't pretty, I wouldn't take this route. If you're going to convert, I would encourage you to convert it into a Canvas page and Literally what I would do is cut and paste the content from the PDF, again, into a, a text editor like Notepad, cut and paste that into Canvas, and then add your headings and lists and such. That's going to be the quickest and cleanest way to get these things fixed. But if you wanted to save a PDF as a Word, you 
a Word document, you can do that. Go to File. And here's the key to this. It's um, something people don't often think about. You're not going to do Save As, which is what we're used to. You're going to do Export To. So do Export To Word and then save it as a Word file. Okay. Similarly, in, um, in Mac, you're going to um, export the PDF as a Word document. Here are PDF resources for you. All right, and that leaves us with time for questions. This was really fast. Um, and I know folks have lots of questions. And so I would encourage you at this point, um, Karen, maybe if you could summarize what's been happening in the chat. And if folks want to um, post more questions in the chat, we can do that as well. Sure, let me just drag this over. Okay, so some of the questions that we've had, let me just scroll up here. Um, so is the there a way to fix Word or PowerPoint files um, supplied by publishers? Kind of like uh, what we talked about is try to reach out to the publisher first. I mean, one of the things that, you know, drives everyone in America, it feels like, or at least businesses is money. So I always tell the publishers, I need an accessible version or I can't order your textbook anymore. Sorry. And I'm going to tell my peers not to order your textbook either because it's not accessible. And usually um, that creates some kind of a reaction or response, unless they're really tiny. But if it's a bigger organization, they'll usually go, oh, let me get you an accessible version and they'll fix it. Um and if they don't, that's a sign to me that maybe I want to switch anyway, because they're not very responsive. But but a lot of times they are, you should be able to try to remediate them um, if you want to. So um, somebody said, how about converting my PowerPoint to PDF? Is it necessary in Canvas? And I was saying um, there are free PowerPoint viewers out there. I think at least in my district, everyone's also entitled to a free student version of um, Microsoft PowerPoint. Maybe that's a statewide thing. So you could ask them to include that and then include the I would just say the first time you use a PowerPoint in the course, make sure you link them or tell them where to find the software that they can use to open it. Um, and then if you do convert it to PDF, just make sure you're very careful, like Suzanne said, about checking it again, um, because sometimes you think, oh, what could go wrong? And you know, technology loves to glitch just when everything looks perfect. So similarly, someone said, if I ran the accessibility checker on Word and then convert to PDF, can I assume it's now accessible? I wish I could say yes, but the answer is things go wrong. You should check it again. But once you get used to it, it that check will be very fast, hopefully. Um, and then this was a question that I was um, working on trying to figure out. So maybe you will know, Suzanne. Um, Desi said, um, I've run into reading order problems in Word uh, for example, when a history book captions its own photos. And so it's basically reading the captions in the wrong place. And uh, it was the question was, is there a way to fix MS Word when it reads the order wrong? And I was not 100% sure. Do you know? I, do, I don't know. And this is actually um, another one of the reasons where having it be a um, an online version tends to be cleaner because what you actually want is, um, and actually Canvas does this badly. So I'm gonna wag my finger at Canvas for this, but they don't they don't have a caption um, tag, right? So some the way this should read, if you if you do HTML coding, you have the picture, the picture is in a figure element, and the caption is part of that figure element. And I don't know if that's possible in Word um, because that's the only way, it, it's not even a reading order issue. It's an issue of unless the image and the caption are tagged as the same item, students wouldn't know who are using a screen reader that the caption is part of the image. Um, and so that's a really good question that that um, I need to Google. Can you, do, can you add captions in Word? I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. And then thank you. Um, so we had a couple questions just come through. Um, outreach creates marketing flyers with many images and flashy fonts and headings. My campus too. Is there a training to make event flyers accessible? 
Um, I'm not sure I can maybe uh, have our CVC slash at one experts tell us, but I will say um, things, I, for instance, I like designing things in Canva, but a Canva doesn't make accessible flyers and it can be very difficult to, to make them accessible. Um, so our, our experts, um, our hosts, uh, do we have any trainings on um, making event flyers accessible? Um, we do not currently, but it would be great to include that when they fill out the survey as feedback for future. Yeah. And there, there's there's um, also, a, 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 it's worth thinking about the purpose of the flyer, right? So if the flyer is meant to be printed and hung on a wall, um, that's one um, one thing to consider, right? So that's where you're 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 thinking specifically about people that are are looking at the flyer, and um and I, I I love colors, but most of our flyers have so many colors it's actually difficult to read what's happening, um in just in general, um but you also want to consider maybe the other version you can have on the flyer itself a QR code where students can use their phone and have it take them to an accessible version of the information. That's a website that has the content in an accessible format so that we don't have to create, in, in my mind, so this is opinion and Karen, feel free to disagree with me. If we have a printed flyer with a QR code that takes students to an accessible version of the information, I would be less worried about making the flyer itself accessible. Yeah, I think it's a good point that the the use case matters and that, you know, when you're stuck providing an accessible version is a is a good start and definitely more than a lot of other places are doing. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so we did have a question about a quick demo on the color contrast. Um, so I am going to try to create a sample right now, but Suzanne, maybe you could help with a, a different question, which is. What if you are using websites, documents, resources from the internet that are not accessible but helpful to students? Any suggestions? I know you mentioned reaching out to a publisher, but in some cases, this may not be an option. Ideas? Maybe Suzanne, you can answer that, and I'll make a quick color cast demo. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, one of the tools that we didn't talk about here because this was specific to documents, right? If you find a online resource and you want to check accessibility, the WAVE tool is um, amazing. So I'm going to put the link to that um, in the chat. And the WAVE tool is, is an accessibility checker. It'll tell you if um, what sort of issues there are on the page. So if you find a page that has a lot of accessibilities, what can you do? And there are kind of a, a cascading set of things to do. First is to reach out to the content creator and ask them if they would be willing to make it accessible. If it's a, um, a bigger content, like um, PBS has a surprising amount of videos that are not captioned, which was shocking. But if it's a bigger content creator like that, they might be willing to fix the accessibility issues. But on, on, on websites, they tend to be smaller, personal created, right? Like I created stuff for my class and I put it out to share with the world. And the person that created it may not have the bandwidth to make it accessible. So then you could ask something like, can I help you make it accessible? Let's work together, right? And one of the really good things to look for is if content is openly licensed, then you can just download it and make it accessible and then maybe share it back out with the original content creator, right? Because a lot of folks just don't know how to do these things. And so if we all work together as educators, we can make the world a little more accessible. And is, you know, isn't that a lovely thing? So those are kind of the cascading options. Um, the last step in that cascade is if they won't make it accessible, if it's not openly licensed, which means you can't make it accessible, then you just can't use it. Um, a lot of times folks will say something like, but it's optional. And the problem with, but it's optional is 
if it helps students, that means it's only helping some students. If it doesn't help students, then why is it in your class, right? Like it is either helpful, in which case it needs to be helpful for everybody, or maybe you don't need it. And I, you know, it's always, it's, I don't like to take that kind of a hard line with things, but in most cases, you want to reach out to the folks and, and see if they're willing to work with you. And I think most folks want to, they just maybe don't know how. You know, Karen, thoughts on that? And you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think um, a lot of people just don't know how to do it. And there are... I think most people would like their content to be more accessible. So um, if you're willing to help, um, they're usually happy about that. If you can reach them, right? It kind of depends. And then sometimes you just have to abandon like a website that you love because it's there's you just can't remediate it and you have to find something that's similar online. And so I've had to do that as well, too, where it's like, it's going to be too challenging for me to fix it. The creator is unfindable or non-responsive, and I just have to find something similar that is accessible. Um, I just wanted to show you um, briefly a quick example of checking for um, color accessibility. Um, so I just made a little document, a little fake document here, um, where I tried to make the color contrast really bad. Um, so the general rule is that you want there to be a lot of contrast. So darker fonts on lighter backgrounds, lighter fonts on darker backgrounds. Um, but I, ideally, some of this should be caught by the checker. Um, so I'm going to show you one example word, which is checking it, catching it, and one which is uh, on PowerPoint where it's not. Um, but there are various different extensions and tools that help you differentiate between contrast. I put one in the chat, but there's several out there. Um, and, um, but anyway, so let's say here, so I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to go to review and then check accessibility. So um, if I go over here, it's giving me inspection results. Hopefully you're able to see that. So when I click on MLA formatting, it says, why fix? Text becomes difficult to read when the color is too similar to the color behind it. Increasing contrast makes text easier, easier to read, especially when viewing documents in bright light. Increase contrast by changing the color of the font or by changing the page color. So on a Word document, I'm rarely changing the color. I want it to be white almost all the time um, because I want it to be easy to print if they want to. So in this case, I could just kind of experiment, you know, with and see when I even made it that blue in this size, that warning went away. Um, and some of it has to do with size too, because the bigger the font, um, sometimes it can be a little bit lighter. Um, if this was really tiny, like let's see if anything happens when I put this, this at eight. Well, it's technically still accepting it, but I could just say like I'm straining to read that, right? So um, if you're using things that don't have a high contrast, either make it a higher contrast or go larger. So um, for this one, this one is passing, but technically for me, unless it was like a hyperlink or something, I would probably use one of these darker blues at the bottom of a kind of like when you hit the carrot and there's the ones that get closer to black. Those are the ones I usually use. You also can try making something um, bold to see if that helps with the, the color contrast issue. Um, but this one is passing now, but then this nonsense down here, nonsense language I put in green is not. And so it's going to give me that same message and say it's 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 not enough of a contrast. So if I'm really wedded to the idea of green, I'm going to try to go to a darker green. And now that's going to go away. Um, so one of the things you can use is the accessibility checker, as well as um, trying to sort of experiment with what makes sense. Um, just to show you, and then using tools because there is, you know, exact ratios between, and you can enter hex codes and, and have them checked. But, um, just to show you, I do feel like it sometimes doesn't work as well on PowerPoint, which is when you might want to go to one of these other tools. So I, it's hard to see, and I made it that way on purpose, but this says MLA formatting. 
It's black on um, a dark green background. I personally think this is hard to read. Um, but when I go to review and say check accessibility, it says no accessibility issues detected. So that's why sometimes some of these things do need a manual check um, because I was playing around with this and it's like, even if I was making it the almost the same font as the slide itself, which it's a little hard to find the exact one, but let me try that. Um, I mean, that's so hard to read, I think. Um, and I'm sure it wouldn't pass like an actual checker, but when in this one, when I do check accessibility, it's still saying no issues detected. Um, so if you Google like, uh, cause I know I put one in the chat, but there's several, if you Google like color contrast analyzing tools, there's a couple that will come up. Um, I also shared, um, something I, I recently completed was web aims, accessible, uh, document training. It's usually $125, but they've been offering it for free or it's it's covered by our accessibility center through the California Community Colleges. And they have a bunch of different ratios and tools that they recommend, but it's all proprietary. So they say, you know, you sign that you're not going to share all that, but it's a great tool besides what you can find online um, to kind of explore the color contrast issue. Um, is there anything you would want to add to that, Suzanne? No, I think th this is a really great example of um, we want to feel like the accessibility checker will will make sure we're doing it right. Um, but computers will never be as good as as people for, for these sorts of things. Um, and there was a request. We have about four more minutes. And so unless there are other questions, I'm going to see if I can find the WebAIM contrast checker. Um, because it, it is kind of a, a cool tool. Oh, I linked it in the chat. If Excellent. you go up a little bit. Um, yeah, so y'all can kind of play with that. But um, this is what it looks like. And it'll, so you can pick, you know, the background uh, color. You can choose the background. So if you go into your PowerPoint and, and kind of pick that color, right, when you go into the color picker in PowerPoint, it'll give you the hex code and you can add it here. Um, and the font for the front side. And so let's pick something that's not great. Right. And what this, what, what's cool about the web aim checker is th this is kind of what Karen was talking about where large text doesn't have to have as much contrast because it's bigger. So this is saying my color choice, which is not good, technically passes for large text, but it fails for small text. And so um, this is a really good tool to, to confirm because as we saw the PowerPoint one doesn't work great. And I think we're about out of time because I know we, we wanted to turn it back to um, the CBC folks for, for closing out. Thank you all for that wonderful, thank you so much um, for that wonderful webinar. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and giving the facilitators your attention. Once again, please look to the chat for the survey link to complete it. It's very, very helpful for CBC. Um, and the survey is set up to allow you to receive a copy of your response, which can serve as verification for your attendance. But if you experience any issues, please reach out to support at cbc.edu. Uh, we hope you register for other webinars that we'll be offering throughout the term. There's a few more coming up. Uh, we'll drop a link in the chat that showcases our upcoming uh, events. And uh, lastly, this webinar and associated slides will be available at our At One website, and we will also drop that link in the chat. Thank you all so much for being here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye.
All right. Um, thank you all. I always love to hear you talking.